Max Haining is the founder of 100 Days of No Code. Like any other good, useful product, he started 100 Days of No Code to learn no code himself and realized that more people like him wanted to join him on a similar journey. We spoke about habit formation, compounding of knowledge, taking advantage of a community to learn something better. Max also spoke about the trends in no code, the limitations of no code and how entrepreneurs and non-tech founders should be thinking about no code and low code. If you're curious about no code or want to learn about community building, you will absolutely love this chat. We also talked about his experience at Wimbledon. And remember, remember to subscribe to our show on whatever platform you're getting this on. That way, you'll get notified when we publish a new episode and we do have many interesting guests lined up for you. This is the CTQ Smartcast, where we have conversations about up-leveling, deliberate practice and getting future relevant. Hi, Max. Uh, welcome to the CTQ Smartcast. Hey, um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really looking forward to, to getting into some good topics today. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's let's jump in uh, straight away. So can you briefly talk about the whole philosophy behind 100 Days of No Code? What is it all about? Of course, yeah. So essentially, it's all about habit building um, and systems behind learning a new skill and that happens to be no code so there's 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 so many different 100 day challenges out there in the world for cooking for writing for 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 gaming or or whatever you want or for coding um for that matter so it's kind of a proven like way i mean if you learn anything for 100 days you're probably going to be quite quite good at it but um i think where the the interesting thing comes is is in the compounding effects of doing it for every day so one day kind of adding on top of the next. So that is kind of where the, the 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 key value lies. But then there's kind of some some subsidiary like additional benefits to doing a hundred days. And like part of the philosophy is sharing what you're learning. And that all ties into the whole building public movements um, and being able to kind of uh, share your story and let other people in on that story as you grow, as you learn, as you develop new skills. So I think that's kind of another part of the general uh, philosophy of 100 days. But uh, yeah, um, that's kind of where it's come from. And it's essentially got three rules to it. Um, Do 30 minutes of no code learning a day, every day for 100 days share what you're learning every day so whether that's on twitter or linkedin or whatever platform you're using um and before you do both of those things make sure you publicly commit to actually doing the challenge doing the 100 days because this is a perfect driver to hold yourself accountable um because you can't really back out if your friends know that you're you're doing this thing so yeah (laughs) (laughs) right that's that's fantastic uh max so uh, how did you you know stumble upon this was this a culmination of a bunch of things that you had tried out what was Mm -hmm. your inspiration for doing this sure um so rather ironically after university i was very keen on finding various boot camps and various educational resources to help me actually learn to code. Um, That was something I was really keen to do because worked at some startups before that. And one of the key reasons or or failings behind them was because none of them had like technical co-founders. So kind of planted a seed in my mind. I, I wanted to become technical. And that's when I started looking at wanting to learn to code that was the only kind of means to doing that at the time this is kind of 2018 um 2019 and then i stumbled across a a tweet or or an article um from ryan hoover the founder of product hunt who um delved into kind of the rise of no code and i was thinking what the hell is this 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 weird um space i thought i'd check it out and that was kind of when my eyes were open to this this at the time very early uh, space but also a very exciting one that promised essentially um, lots of things around being able to build without having to learn to code um, so that kind of changed my thinking uh, and after a while I kind of delved deeper into it the space um, and tried to learn it 
and tried to get my my toes wet into the space but actually I found it difficult because I didn't know what to, to learn I didn't know what tools to pick I didn't have a structure for learning um so I kind of dipped in and out didn't make any progress and was just kind of flailing that's when the pandemic hit uh, so this is uh, March of last year we suddenly have a lot more time on our hands we're locked in our rooms and that's kind of when I realized oh this is a perfect time to learn a new skill I want to learn to no code but I still don't have the structure for it and that's when I combined the 100 days of code challenge which I'd seen and which I was previously gonna like take part in and then just uh, swapped it for for no code. Um, so, so it was, and then I started. I started doing it myself, and other people joined. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is this is fantastic and resonates a lot with uh, me because uh, I, I choose to think we actually uh, run something called a CTQ compounds. The the word compounds actually comes from you know the whole compounding philosophy. And we've been helping people read regularly, you know, and a lot of elements that you've talked about are very similar. Uh, people uh, subscribe to this, they sign up and they're part of a cohort of 10 people at, at a time. Each cohort is of 10 people mm -hmm. and they read every day. What we aim for is 15 minutes of reading. Uh, so it's much easier for uh, people to say that, okay, I have 15 minutes to commit to this. Uh, you know, if, if you tell me to read War and Peace, no, I'm not going to read that. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of six months, we tell them that you've actually read, uh, you know, as much as uh, what yeah. also had written. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so we we see we see this in uh, action, and you know, I'm I'm, I'm seeing a lot of things that that you are talking about, which we have also seen with with respect to what we've been doing with uh, CTU compounds. So, so the first question that uh, I wanted to ask you with, with this in, in the uh, backdrop, Max, was about uh, the, the whole uh, importance of having a cohort uh, when, when you're doing something together and, you know, whenever you're trying to build a habit, I, that, you know, they say there are two ways of building a habit. Either you be part of a, a group which is all trying to do that, so you are on the same journey. Or you go and join a group which is already, you know, living the kind of life that you want to be, uh, mm. uh, you know, leading, right? So then you you look at others and you say, I want to be like these people, so I'm going to do, do the same thing. So these are the two best ways of, of forming mm. a habit. Uh, yeah. Both of us are trying to, you know, take, take the whole journey uh, approach. So mm. what is the role of the cohort here, especially in, in your case where people are... Mm joining in from all over the world they're trying to do something around uh, no coding sure yeah really really great question um i think yeah the idea of kind of building a habit i think that starts with as you say kind of taking the or making that uh choice easier so you you mentioned about um 15 minutes a day for for, for reading a book or doing some reading like that to me is so small that i don't even really need to think about it is that oh only 15 minutes okay well, well that's easy like that's so easy cool let's do that so and that is kind of why or, or how i think you you need to start is really framing uh your learning around something that's so easy that it kind of becomes a bit of a no-brainer and that is why we started with the 30 minute thing so it kind of revolves around that i mean it, regardless of whether there be a cohort or not if we started saying you need to do like 10 hours of this a day like the cohort is just not it won't do its job so it kind of needs to be revolving around something that everyone can do that's sustainable um will we'll still give you enough juice to actually learn that skill so i think that's where it starts but actually yeah where the cohorts come into play for 100 days is is essentially the momentum that it gives you and the sense that you're all in this together um Therefore, um, if you're having a struggle one day or you're, you're not moving as quickly as you like, there's always going to be someone ahead of you or behind you that you can kind of look up or down to who can help you out in that moment. But, but in terms of cohorts at the moment, it's interesting you ask that because we, we actually work on a, a rolling basis so people can join and start right, anytime right. they like. But where the kind of the, the force of or the, the effects of a kind of a cohort based model come in is the community that we have alongside um, 
people just you know starting and finishing their hundred days so we we have a group of people learning and doing the same thing just maybe not on the, the same time scale and that is that's where the kind of the, the the sprinkling of cohort comes into play but actually it's something where we're, we're looking at doing is is setting everyone off sort of pressing the like the the this um the starting gun at the same time for everyone um and seeing how that works and i think you're right that could be even more powerful right right and and you know something that we have seen is we've also introduced uh, some element of rewards and penalties uh, you know mm. as as you're part of the uh, group because if you don't read you know it actually results in a group penalty uh, mm. so it's it's mm. much more difficult to let down the group <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> than that when you're doing it for yourself. Uh, but of course, really it, it does impose the restriction that you have to start that as part of a cohort. So we have both, mm. um, you know, cohort based as, as well as non cohort based, mm. uh, uh, you know, kind of groups. But that's been something which is, uh, uh, you know, very uh, interesting that, that we've been seeing. So I'll be really interested to know how your experience with, you know, these kind of cohort <laughs> dynamics uh, goes, goes in the future. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I'm happy to share any insights. And I really, I think that's such a good idea. The group based kind of like penalty. I mean, it may it may seem harsh, but it's, it, it reminded me of um, this thing called fret betting, which essentially, you, you can get your enrollees, your your students to pay like double the amount of the actual course, the, pri the, the, the price of the course. And then if they don't finish it, they have to pay double. If they do finish it, they have to pay the normal price. So kind of, again, yeah, they ha playing with those incentives. And I haven't done that yet. I don't know if people will like me if I do that, but that's, that's <laughs> definitely something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah. an another thing that that uh, you mentioned, which uh, mm. struck me, was uh, you know, was the whole curation bit. Again, this is uh, coming from yeah. our own experience, where people trust us with the curation. That uh, yes, I'm I'm saying that I'm going to give you my 15 minutes. You need to yeah. make sure that you know whatever you send to me for reading is worth my 15 minutes. Similarly, it's very important for you to make that right kind of gradation when it comes mm. to learning about no code. Because if you're going to give me something very tough in the first, you know, five or six days, I'm going to get dejected and I'm going to say, oh, this is not for me. Right. Mm. So how do you make sure that curation and gradation of the learning is, is you know, as it should be for a, a project like this? Yeah, really, really great question. And I think it's tough. It is very tough because because people enter all different levels. They have right. Uh, diff all different goals and especially something like no code there's so many tools there's a there's a new tool released every week if um you know probably which, which adds to the the uh, amount of variables amount of options at play which makes it harder to curate because you're always trying to double guess kind of the path uh, that most people will get the most from um versus multiple paths that different personas can get the most from and i think i think it probably when you're starting a new project you kind of have to just lay out one path and then as you scale it you probably have to become more precise for those different personas but um what we've done is kind of taken like a, a first principles approach and taken like the fundamentals of no code learning so sort of being really tool agnostic kind of stripping it back to actually what does no code building learning mean? Uh, what skills do I need to have regardless of which tool? Uh, those include like database design, UI, UX, uh, API knowledge, and that kind of thing before then even letting people touch the tools. But also, I think it's nice to always give the option for people to kind of curate their own journey to some extent. So giving that sense of option or set of options but not too many options where they feel paralyzed. So this, again, it's a tricky, so, oh, today you can learn um, this or this, um, but you can't say today you can learn one of these 10 things, because then it's just like, oh my gosh, which one should I pick? So I think there's the, 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 there's a few things at play there in curate, curating for sure. Right. Right. Mm. And and when you're talking about, you know, different personas in your uh, experience, what are the different kinds of personas that you are seeing who are taking up something like, uh, you know, 100 days of no coding? Yeah, good question. Because it is, yeah, no code, it does appeal to 
a certain type of person, but it is also like it could have mass appeal for the amount of use use cases it can be used for. But for the like for the stage it's at in the movement in the space, it's definitely appealing probably to entrepreneurs. Okay. So I think seventy percent of no coders are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs. So that kind of segment is like the key persona. But now we're seeing so s- startup operators, um, so uh, and just bigger organizations and companies wanting to leverage no code for automation for optimization within organizations. So I think there's there's entrepreneurs, there's kind of companies and small startups that, that want that knowledge uh, to train up their staff. Um, and then you have just like more of the creator economy focused people that are like uh, just side project makers um, and want to put s- stuff out there for fun. And those are kind of the three I'm generally seeing at the moment, persona wise. Right, mm-hmm. right. And and uh, is there any view that you have on children learning, you know, no code? Is it too early for them? It's like, uh, you know, are you denying them the opportunity to go deep into, you know, core programming? Uh, sure. is, is there any thought around that? <laughs> really, really good question. I think it's a very interesting kind of space um, that hasn't been served too much yet. Um, I think uh, to your point around whether it kind of it's like one or the other at that stage is like, oh, well, if they start to know code, then they're not going to be able to go deep into code. I think it's probably the opposite. I think it's actually the perfect on ramp into coding if that is something someone wants to do, because uh, that's a trend I keep seeing is people start to no code, and then they once they hit the limits of this space, they suddenly have to cross cross their cross cross into the territory of code um, and low code. Um, so actually, I think no code is a perfect starting point, um, regardless of whether someone or a kid young person wants to to end up in code or no code but i i yeah that is certainly something that should be taught um in schools and part of the the syllabus for universities etc um it should be a fundamental part of it for for any student i think yeah i i could see the use case for basically every degree yeah right yeah yeah and and the at the other end of the spectrum do you you mentioned limitations of no code or even low code right uh, mm. so do you see no code and low code being used primarily for shipping out an mvp the, the minimum viable product or uh, you know get something working a prototype so that everyone understands what say you know an entrepreneur has in his or her mind or do you actually see you know people using this for live products and then you you know you're probably misusing this <laughs> you know where it should not be used is that is that the case what's those you know limitations mm. that you're talking about yeah and and smiling cuz yeah it's it's definitely like a debate that kind of is ongoing on on twitter and so there there isn't like one answer to that but i think i think yes i think the 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 sort of main use case for no code in its current form in terms of its limits and just what it's good for is is the, the the prototyping the MVPs and validating the concept that you have. I think that is is perfect for that. But that is not to say you cannot actually scale up with no code tools. So and it it does again depend largely on the tool you're using. So I'd have very different answers for for, for different tools. Um, so if we're talking about you know, the go-to for kind of building web apps and, and software as a service businesses, then Bubble is probably appropriate to scale to thousands of users. Um, so there's an app called Coins, which is a fintech business uh, that is built purely on Bubble and has got thirty to 50,000 um, users a month uh, using it. So that's just one case, and there are more more examples like that. But then if you're using different tools, and uh, yeah, you may want to keep that within the MVP and prototype scope. So it really depends on what tool you're using. But the one thing I will say is that the longer this space is, or the the the, the lo- yeah, the the time that this space is growing and maturing, the more 
powerful, the more scalable things will be. So it may not be quite there yet, but one year, two years, five years down the line, yeah, they will be, they will be scalable. Right, right. Uh, that's on the scalability part. But do you have any thoughts or comments on how economical would it be for an entrepreneur, you know, somebody who has not done any coding to you know, start mm. with something like a Glide apps or a, a bubble? Since these have been designed for the no coder, if I want to use that term, uh, you know, it, it can probably get very expensive to run, you know, an ongoing product on these platforms as well as compared to probably getting it developed by, uh, you know, by, by a partner. So is, is there something like a Goldilocks ratio where, you know, for these kind of, you know, these many number of users, this is great. And after that, you should probably look for something else. <laughs> yeah, that I wish I wish I had like a that I could cast iron number for you. <laughs> I really I really wish I had. I I yeah, I think I I think it's always going to be less expensive than at least that initial period than hiring a developer. In terms of the number of users you have until you maybe move ship, you 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 go fully coded. I think that's a judgment call on 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 that particular business because they may have a roadmap that just goes beyond the limits of no code right, but if right. it doesn't then i don't see any reason why you wouldn't stay within no code because generally like for, in terms of an economics point of view like the the cost of these platforms are you know on a monthly basis so that you can pay monthly or yearly and the prices i've seen is kind of um looking at like 70 70 80 dollars a month which really you know isn't that much if you've got you know decent chunk of users and if you're doing it with code regardless of whether you're going to have the, the the cost of development um you're going to have ongoing costs right of, of yeah, hosting right. and all that stuff which no code platforms do for you so i think that's a judgment call really on on that business at that time but um i think no code is pretty economical it will get more expensive though if you're combining lots of tools together and then you've got multiple like subscriptions just going on in the background right right yeah so that's, that's something to uh, think about for entrepreneurs as well not not to uh, you know not to go blind uh, yeah. into the no code <laughs> exactly <laughs> well. right yeah yeah, yeah. So another question that I had, Max, was um, hmm. this whole notion about starting with an end outcome in mind. Uh, if you have a project or a product idea, it, it at least to me naturally it it comes. Uh, it, it's you know very easy for me to figure out what all is it going to take for me to you know go to that outcome. I've, I've not done any coding in my life, uh, but I've you know created a, a code in Visual Basic 20 years ago to implement an algorithm. And then I've done Glide apps, Airtable, uh, you mm -hmm. know, Bubble, Zapier, all these things I've used. Only when I actually had, uh, you know, the use case clear to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you were to just tell me, okay, let's go learn these fundamentals of XYZ, I'm going to say, uh, you know, I'm going to start the first couple of days and then it's going to, the, my interest is going to wane. <laughs> Uh, so what's your uh, notion, you know, what's your comment on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, I think um, if I was to kind of analyze the people that make the most of 100 days or learn no code in the best way, it is definitely those that have got like an outcome driven approach and who have normally a project in mind that they really want to bring to life. Um, so yeah, I think there definitely is those people that kind of come in um, without a project and it makes that learning process more aimless that the, there isn't a target in mind but i think if you go into it without a project that you know you will eventually have one then the skills um and the 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 information you're picking up isn't useless it will be used it just not maybe as quickly as if you had a project that was ready to to be made so uh, yeah um but 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 if you are one of those people that is just curious about the space wants to pick up these tools has not have no product in mind and probably no intention of building anything later down the line then i would give you a set of project ideas to work on to to offset that that effect and actually 
look at like building a marketplace or a directory or landing page or something in that that mix um to give yourself an outlet right yeah yeah i think i think that that uh, makes a lot of sense to have some kind of an you know outcome uh, in mind so so max it's it's been what one and a half years since you've been running this uh, 100 days of, yep. of mm. coach, right? so what have yep. been you know some memorable experiences anecdotes uh, yes. with with the whole pe- you know community that you've been helping i think i think as a, as a community manager community building is is pretty tough in the sense of it is a like a something that you really have to give your all in like to to show your commitment to the community uh, so it's not kind of for the faint hearted or for those that, that that don't want that want to build a community without building community they just want to so so i'd i'd say like with that investment in time um you really look for and want those like highlights and and those 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 things that you look back on and say oh wow that was really worth me kind of pushing this person this just a little extra way to get that project out and um i always like i always enjoy um our we have quarterly demo days so a chance for members to then kind of push out all the the, the projects i've been kind of working heads down on for, for, for a few months prior um and those are really nice because they they just one showcase the kind of the variety of of no code like we've got people building uh speech therapy apps uh that are purely voice based and someone is literally talking to his phone and based off his responses it tells him or instructs him to do um a different exercise which which just that's like such a niche example but one that's kind of really wholesome um because it's solving such a niche problem and helping lots of people in turn so i don't think the, the i guess the 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 answer to the question is there isn't something that sticks out it's more just seeing the realization of someone's idea come to life and that happens like <laughs> like a lot if you're using no code and yeah seeing kind of the reactions and the kind of the, the aha moments of oh i can build this this can be a tangible thing that people use is really nice to see right yeah and and when was uh, the aha moment for you when you actually uh, you know saw this whole <laughs> this is like a product in itself right so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah like yeah doing some meta thinking around this <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny you know cuz it wasn't ever meant to be a product it wasn't yeah. ever meant to be a community it was my selfish like endeavor to just learn this skill over 100 over 100 days right it was there was no It's funny because I was actually my project the reason why I kind of started 100 days as well was to build an online running community <laughs> for runners um and now look how it's turned out it's turned out as a as a as a no code community I mean never would have anticipated that yeah it, it I think the aha moment was initially when people because I said on Twitter openly I'm starting this today um if you want to join me please do i'd love the support and inspiration of others doing it at the same time uh but if not i'm going to do it anyway <laughs> and people jo- joined in that they 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 committed themselves on that first day and i was a, a you know had no followers on twitter or anything like that and even when i posted it to basically no following it still got like you know decent chunk of sort of engagement and that was my first indicator okay people seem to resonate with this this is exciting and then i think it was day 50 for my journey where i i turned from learning to the no code or trying to be a no code builder to then swapping and being a, a a community builder um so i never technically finished my 100 days really um i mean i did finish it but like i was more working on the on it rather than like actually learning these skills in my yeah, second yeah. 50 yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's discuss this later if you want to edit this part out <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> but, Very but, true. Uh, yeah. yeah but, yeah, but yeah. jokes apart yeah. uh, max yeah. i think yeah. this is a fantastic uh, story right i mean this is a great example of how you are solving a problem for yourself and 
you know, in the process, you realize that, you know, there's so many people who are facing the same problem and now they're part of uh, your journey. Uh, so now that you've moved on to, you know, running the community, uh, mm -hmm. did you get any insights? You, as you said, it's not for the faint hearted, you know, what are your insights and learning uh, around running a community, around helping people and, you know, what are the, mm -hmm. the, the tools that help you do a, a, a good job of running a community? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the, the bottom line is, again, it's super generic advice, but I think bottom line is what I found is you, you, you really do have to show up every day in the sense of, you know, replying to those Slack messages, sharing resources on the Slack, uh, and the community, checking in on people. Um, if you, if you feel like they're kind of losing their way on their journey, um, and being, having that kind of periphery knowledge of where people are at on their journey and what help they need and when. Uh, and I know now there's tools that kind of help you do that. So community CRMs um, are now a thing. So you've got things like the Orbit model. You've got, I mean, tools like Airtable, obviously, that kind of help you do a good job of that anyway. But um, so I think just fundamentally you showing up and helping people every day and then you having the knowledge and kind of data to know how to help people and when to help people. And that comes from the kind of the tooling um, a little bit, because I can look at my database and say, oh, this person's on day X, let's go and cheer them up and say, great job, you've just done day 50, amazing. You know, so that kind of thing. So I think that's my, my fundamental lesson. Um, but I'd, I'd sprinkle that with, with, with making sure that you're not building for the community you're building with it so at the start i was like uh like kind of top-down approach of let's just add this thing add this thing add this thing without really like understanding why people would want it or need it um so that's when i started trying to build with like so what are your pain points at the moment what is stopping you from getting to day 50 and then building around those insights and then to just to wrap up this answer i think some of the the other tools i've used that have been really helpful include grain.co uh, for taking highlights from zoom re recordings and then being able to share them especially useful on like a global community because people will never be able to all come to the same event <laughs> at least if it's live and i can share some others with you um to share for listeners after this um after this chat yeah. Sure, sure. We'll, we'll link them in, in the show notes uh, mm -hmm. as well, uh, Max. So, you know, one more question uh, that came to mind. You said, you know, you didn't have a lot of followers on Twitter, uh, but, mm -hmm. but people sort of, you know, just got attracted to the whole notion and, and they, mm -hmm. uh, you know, joined you. So how important do you think is having something like a social capital around, you know, what you are doing mm -hmm. uh, in order to initiate a community like this or having that, you know, weight around yourself as a community manager. How important is it in, in these days uh, to be working on your social capital as well? Yeah, I think it's it's pretty big. Um, I think I was kind of a bit lucky, um, really. Um, kind of right time, start of the pandemic when people needed some, a channel, an outlet to do something else. Uh, just just it kind of popping up on one person's feed and then re retweeting it and they happen to have a large following. So it kind of, I think I was lucky in it in a way. So I would definitely not rely on luck next time if I was doing it again and kind of try and build a steady following who trust me, who um, enjoy what I post and, and have that relationship with me and then share something. So whether that is a, a course you're building or a, um, a business you're starting or whatever that may be or an event you're hosting um, having those followers just it, like immeasurably helps in anything you're kind of doing especially if you're giving value to them every day because they're always or more likely going to want to reciprocate that later down the line when you when you have that ask for me that ask would be come join the 100 days of no code but others it could be anything else Right, right. And, and, you know, it, continuing with this, do you think building a community of your own is going to be a lot more common and mainstream now, given people have mm. different kinds of interests and, you know, they want to build that whole brand and community around either themselves or whatever they believe in? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. I, 
yeah, I haven't really explored that topic much about building your community around yourself. Almost, I, I've not, I've not looked into that much. But, but I see more and more people doing that on Twitter. It's not cool. I mean, they've ne- they've not called it like a community, but like there is a community there that revolves around that person that answer their questions, that retweet and share their things. Um, they're they're essentially members of that person's community in a way. I've never really thought about it that much, but. I think that is important and that is always a good starting point before then maybe starting your own community or under a different brand or or, do, or doing something else um so i think yeah trust is just especially online is so so important when people haven't met you in person it, yeah if you can cultivate that that will sh- should go a long way right yeah yeah i guess it 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 all boils down to what you you the word that you use trust right Uh, i mean i i I know that max was uh at at wimbledon once uh (laughs) because i've been following you on twitter (laughs) so so tell me more about that experience that's got nothing to do with uh, no coding but yeah in in my mind now suddenly you've been raised at a pedestal <laughs> so this is the thing. This is like, I again, I hadn't really done much of this beforehand. But like sharing a bit more about you as well. Like I was probably the first post I'd done in ages. Like that was more a little bit more personal rather than just like like kind of community building advice or just like tips and tricks for like using Slack or something. So I think it kind of caught people off guard, but people really just enjoyed it because it was something different and they were like oh i'm learning something new about that person um but yeah in terms of uh, <laughs> i'm glad that yeah i'm glad you you saw that yeah um in terms of yeah wimbledon it was it, essentially i i was uh used to be a ball boy um i uh, you know when i was like 13 14 just chasing after balls um and it was yeah it was really fun i mean you, you got to see all the the top players and and then w- when i got kind of a little bit too old for that they were it was kind of what well, do you want to now cover the courts when it rains um and obviously it rains a lot in the uk <laughs> so so that that job is quite necessary and uh yeah i covered the courts and then also when it was sunny i'd be holding the umbrellas for players to kind of uh, make sure they um weren't getting battered by the the heat so yeah it, it was it was a fun fun job and yeah uh definitely now when wimbledon's on it it, it I, i'm not sure if i'd want to go back to it but i it, it was it's a nice memory to have yeah and and which years uh were you at at wimbledon so i was i was there 2012 2013 and then 2016 to 2019 yeah 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 so yeah a good chunk of years actually yeah yeah <laughs> no you think about it yeah yeah <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, and, and yeah. uh you were there during the finals or, or uh, was it yeah i mean i was so, like you kind of picked based on your abilities and right. when i was a ball boy i wasn't a very good ball boy so i wasn't ever doing the finals mm-hmm. or like the big games you know I, I would appear on some some nice courts but never like the bigger the the big matches because they were that was kind of reserved for like the the fastest the quickest the mm-hmm. everything you know but yeah for the the court attending the court covering um i i i uh was uh yeah i did a few finals um just kind of holding the umbrellas so it's quite it's just quite funny yeah what a job just just standing there with an umbrella um yeah <laughs> so if, if anyone needs an umbrella umbrella holder you know where i am so yeah <laughs> And and do you play tennis? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, I mean, again, not very well, but but just for enjoyment. Um, so yeah, I do. Yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. you must be biased with the the benchmarks that you've uh, set for yourself. I know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually funny. Every time I um, because uh, you're watching the players like solidly for two weeks, and you think, oh, I'm gonna be really really good at tennis after this um because i've watched all their technique and stuff and then you try and replicate their technique and you're even worse than when you were before it's just so (laughs) bad so so don't do that yeah (laughs) that's that's a very useful tip i guess (laughs) 
yeah. so so you know one interesting thought that came to mind when when you mentioned this right the whole yes. notion of uh, building in public uh, right when you look mm. at these people uh, sports people you know they they're mm. actually struggling and uh, failing in in most cases they're actually losing most tennis players probably lose yeah. more matches even federer has lost more matches than he's won in his yeah. life <laughs> so so you know are there any parallels that you draw between uh, you know how a sports person goes uh, about you know doing their job and the whole building in public notion i it's a brilliant question yeah i haven't i hadn't thought about it like that at all but it, you're right they they are building in public without actually knowing they're building in public <laughs> like <laughs> they they are all their i know that most of them have got good media teams and stuff but ultimately they when they they're at their most vulnerable uh, is showing their abilities is showing and that's when they're on the court and um if you say the highs and the lows there's probably more lows in a tennis career than highs and yeah that i guess that goes for any sport really um and losing in public is is tough i can imagine and that that is kind of seeing the emotion and the what what that does to someone is probably um you know is again part of the fans resonating with that person even more because they can relate to it um you know just what happened to to Andy Murray in 2012 he lost the yeah. final that year and then he, he you know he was distraught he was upset in the interviews of course he was and people really you know really felt that he felt felt those tears and then he won it the next year and, okay. um you know that that's i think a perfect yeah kind of God in public example really yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i think that that's a great uh, you know parallel to uh, to draw from the world of sports with uh, you know building in public so a uh, final couple of questions max uh, what's sure. what's your vision about no code and uh, you know how do you see it enabling people in future all all kinds of people from all walks of life it's yeah i feel like at the moment it's um it really is not even scratch the surface of what it's capable of doing how many lives it's can impact um and it's 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 still firmly in the tech bubble so it's it's in a space where most people you know know all this lingo know what building public means all this twitter stuff like it it's it's kind of feels quite restrained to that space i mean there's there's been exceptions to that i am really keen to help move it beyond this bubble um to educate more people whether that is that that's kids um young people whether that's university students um whether that's people in different industries than tech um but essentially one kind of raising awareness as to what no code is why it should be used why you should be excited by it but then also educating people how to to start leveraging it for their own lives and and to help others as well and uh yeah i feel like um there's a lot of work to be done to kind of actually uh realize the whole excitement behind no code which is democratizing software development it, it does do that but if it if it wants to do that on the scale of not just millions of people but billions of people then we really need to start spreading the word and and educating more people and raising awareness more so i think that's on a very general level kind of what i'm keen to do is is get more people using it <laughs> right yeah. right and yeah. and uh, for to to make that a reality uh, you know what mm-hmm. would you recommend for people to have in terms of a right mindset for learning how should they be thinking about learning i mean today i i go click on a tweet and say i like it uh there's lots that going on behind it uh, so how do i develop that uh, lens to actually start thinking about things like this yeah um i would say i mean i think if you're entering no code or trying to learn a new skill um i would certainly especially in the, the no code sense i would certainly just lower expectations from what all the marketing campaigns say like don't expect to build a website in 5 minutes like off the bat <laughs> like just 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 like s- slow down just like take a breath and understand that it will take you know it is a skill to be learned it's not something you can just pick up and you're you're there um so i think being patient in the process of learning is is key and then 
and then making sure as as we kind of live by 100 days making sure you share that knowledge so other people can connect with your journey but also that you're 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 sharing it in a way where you're embedding what you've just learned and kind of as we touched on earlier in this chat making sure that you have an outlet for it so you've shared that knowledge you've learned that knowledge what are you going to do with it um optimize for creation over consumption every time because that's a trap i fell into and so many do oh i've just watched a youtube video that's perfect i've just taken in lots of knowledge what are you going to do about it so yeah <laughs> um that that's probably a message i'd like to on a learning front try to leave people with a bit yeah. Right, right. So, so do you think, uh, you know, if if we just look at the whole uh, 100 days of no code, do you think we can actually think of it as a blueprint for, you know, learning anything, not just no code, but, you know, if you apply these principles, do you think that is something which can be applied to any, any, any topic? I think it's so, the, the framework is so simple, yet kind of powerful that, yeah, it, it could be, it could be actually applied to to anything really um i think what's kind of useful about it as well is that although we touched on it's so small the the daily kind of input that you have to give it, which makes it almost a no-brainer i think the flip side to that or the addition to that is that having it as 30 minutes a day means that it's accessible to lots of people everyone's got jobs got families got things to do 30 minutes a day is is accessible to most people. Um, they can slice that out of their schedule. Um, I think that's another interesting thing about the model is is that accessibility. So anyone that's busy can actually do it as well. And I think people get lost in that. Oh my gosh, it's a hundred days. Well, it's not really. It's two days um, if you if you add up those thirty minutes. It's just thirty minutes spread over a hundred days, and that's what makes it accessible. But it also means that you're building momentum, and you're not just learning something all at once, and then you're kind of crashing and burning. You're actually learning it progressively, incrementally over time, and then that endpoint, you're you're skilled and you're you're fully you you will have fully reaped the compound effects of that as well right right and and do you see this uh you know being sort of appealing for people in the in, you know people who have never coded have reached a certain stage in their careers where uh, you know they're not entrepreneurs they're not founders they don't have a product mm. idea uh, but they're going to hit a ceiling very soon in terms of their career progression uh, mm. Do you see no code or at least something like a 100 day uh, challenge of no code being the right kind of, uh, you know, trigger for them to potentially start a new career or, or new line in, in their career? Yeah, I, it's tricky to know. I, I, um, it, it's hard to know because I actually put this, this a tweet out there the other day saying, I've just given a presentation on no code and it just made me realize that we need more people to know about no code and then so and someone said i've tried to tell my friends i've tried to say and they're just not interested um and i guess there will always be people like that it's just a question of how many people are like that and whether whether no code is 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 a thing mainly for creators for entrepreneurs i don't know yet um but i certainly feel if if someone is intentionally looking for a career change or to amp up their skill set. No code is like future proofing them is going to be useful regardless. Like they don't need to be creating startups or side projects with it. They can actually just be automating that manual task that they've got on their plate that it just improves or, or reduces, you know, gives them another 30 minutes every week. Like something as small as that uh, they can apply no code with. So I think, I think it's about kind of positioning no code as well and how you position it um, for the different audiences and, and, and making it more appealing in that way as well. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mentioned the daily reader program at uh, CTQ Compound. We have something called as a future stack, uh, which is about, mm. you know, reading for professional growth um, for future mm. relevance. Uh, so we have 26 different themes and uh, across 26 weeks. And one of the themes is actually low code and no code. And we've mm -hmm. had people from, you know, backgrounds like, say, HR, uh, right. who are told by their leaders that, oh, you need to do something with AI and ML. And they have absolutely no clue what to do with it. <laughs> and, and for people like them, this is a great start. One week of a primer on what low code is 
and mm. they can potentially then go ahead uh, that is now understand the language that they need to speak with uh, you know somebody from mm. uh, you know a, a tech company to actually develop something for them but they feel a <laughs> lot more confident so that mm. that was uh, you know where i was coming from yeah yeah that's really good to know that's really good to know that people are doing that and yeah it even just being able to speak the same language um yeah. is yeah as you say is really really important yeah yeah, mm. <laughs> yeah. and, and uh, final question max um, mm. you know what would you recommend in terms of uh, you know people to follow books to read podcasts to listen for someone you know who's say inspired by you and you know wants to just get mm. started in, in the whole world of technology and, and no, no code yeah i would say get on twitter and curate your feed very carefully um when I started Twitter, I was very much dismissive of, oh, it's just people talking politics and like, I don't want that or need that in my life. But actually it is, it's full of interesting people if you follow those interesting people and unfollow those annoying uh, political people. <laughs> um, so uh, then the question comes, who is that? We've actually got a list of uh, kind of no coders to follow in our beginners course um but just a few of like kind of leaders in the space off the top of my head um i would kind of first follow um kp i think he's this is kp uh underscore sharaf um he he'll be followed by by kp um so um those two kind of leaders in the space um and if you check who they're following you're you're get a pretty good idea of who to follow and check who I'm following to an extent, but mine is um, also got some, some sporting accounts on there. So, so it's, it's intermix with rubbish. Um, so, so don't, yeah, don't, don't do that to yourself, but yeah. So that, I think that that's the first thing to do. Then you'll start absorbing interesting things, cool projects being launched, tips for no coding every day on your feed, which is good. Um, and then in terms of podcasts, I think I recently started the My First Million podcast, um, and that's just useful from an ideas point of view. Yeah, if you're you're kind of wanting to close the loop, if you're getting inspiration, you're kind of learning to know code, now I need some ideas, that podcast is kind of full of them, and then you can execute on them with your newfound skills, hopefully. Right. Right. And yeah, I, get, I think one more final question. Mm. Uh, <laughs> what happens after 100 days? <laughs> yeah yeah the 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 magical yeah the mystical yeah yeah it's it's funny yeah because people people think it's almost some spiritual experience once you finish the 100 days um, <laughs> um but what happens after 100 days is a few things i mean in the program people essentially become like alumni and they they take up like more like leadership positions in the community um and you kind of get to share your knowledge more um and kind of develop the community on your own more um so you kind of take that path but actually when people finish 100 days like the tangible outcomes are generally people start to become or make money as freelancers in the no code space um so 100 days is plenty of time to be a be a no code freelancer and start making uh, that your part-time or full-time job um they 100 days they're ready to start they've built their business or built their project now it's time to validate now it's time to get customers so that's often what happens or they kind of just hang around and, and stay inspired and kind of make sure that they're still up to speed with the space so that when they need it they can access that knowledge uh for their next big thing yeah that they're working on yeah I think that mm. that was uh, great, Max. It was a fantastic, mm. uh, close to what, 45 minutes of, of conversation with you. Uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, mm. it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a great initiative that you've got there. And you, know, you seem to have got all the, the, the components of the blueprint uh, right. Uh, and I hope uh, you know, more and more people join uh, the 100 days of uh, you know, no code. And all the best for your tennis as well.
<laughs> thanks so much um uh, no it's been a lot of a lot, lot of fun um really appreciate all the questions they've been fantastic and um yeah looking forward to listening back um thank you